I was uh, going to introduce this last panel by making a comment about people keeping up with change and the challenge of people keeping up with change. And I was rather assuming that I was one of the ones who was keeping up. I'm not so sure after those last two presentations. That challenge which came up last night in the conversations that we had around the speed at which change is happening. And you touched on it as well, David, this idea that the ideas are moving faster than generations can die and keep up with those changes. And going back to Lee's presentation as well, most of the work I see in the big organizations that I work with is frankly lipstick on pigs. It's a token gesture half-heartedly made by people who don't really understand the scale of the challenge. I then wonder if I'm spending my life trying to resuscitate dinosaurs, and that it might be kinder to shoot them and move on. So out of all three presentations, I've had this sense that we're going into a phase shift. And you know, phase shifts in nature tend to end up with cataclysmic flips. So just starting with you, Lee, are we, because we're speeding up all the time, the changes are speeding up, people aren't keeping up with those changes. What is the flip going to feel like? Yeah, it's a good question. Good question, I, I don't really know, but I, I sort of share your view that we've been through a process of grinding, slow attempts to uh, encourage change, which may end up with a complete state flip. Um, and I hope it's not a bad one. Um, I mean, it might just be a state flip for individual organizations or institutions, or it could be more of a, a societal, uh, societal flip. But, you know, that's the way change happens. Um, you know, nothing happens until it happens. And so everything that I've done in the last 12, 15 years has probably been a complete waste of time. <laughs> or at least it's just been leading up to something else. Um, so it is, it is curious. Um, it's a curious question. I mean, the thing is, it's, you know, the, the mistake here is, I think, to, to be sort of anti-institution or anti-company uh, and so on. And I think it's really important sometimes to restate the positive case that um, certainly in a European context, you know, a lot of what we take for granted as stable societies um, in the second half of the uh, 20th century were the result of, you know, first of all, institutions that were naturally conservative, that um, protected and conserved values that were slowly going out of date, but that was okay. And also companies, um, you know, working in a very traditional way to create power industries and to create distribution networks and, and, do, all these, uh, and do all these things. But, you know, that phase is gone. And now we are struggling a little bit to see the relevance of both the institutions and some of the, some of the bigger companies. And that's why I guess a lot of what I've been saying today is almost like a plea um, to more enlightened people in some of these organizations to, to just go for it, you know, to focus on what's good about what they do, the values that they really believe in, um, and to leave behind the, the pretense, you know, the sort of the clothes of work or the clothes of, of corporatism and just, just go forward. And that, funnily enough, that thing about the clothes, you know, I travel into London with people dressed in suits going into work in offices and find myself wondering, what are you all going to do in the future when your current world falls apart? And it may ju not just be automation. It may, it may be the fact that our institutions don't reinvent themselves and keep up. And so it's almost an existential challenge for people. And I'm more and more noticing this evidencing itself. I think people are feeling uneasy. And David, you sort of made me feel uneasy with the scale and the speed and the... Maybe just I, I, I went very light on all of you. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, we, I, I think we have to be ambitious in how we analyze and understand what we mean by uh, organizations slash organisms and, and how they fight for survival. These are not only human organisms, these are corporate organisms. And when they uh, realize that there is a threat, 
they try to find a way to survive. So what we have been seeing in the past 20, 30 years of corporate cap capture of the public interest and the profound distortion of uh, how legislation is being analyzed, implemented, then updated or not updated, is a direct expression of this uh, uh, phase transformation already being in process. And the smartest of the organizations are the ones that realize that it is happening. Um, at the same time, uh, individuals are under increasing stress to perform uh, under conditions that they haven't been prepared for, uh, and uh, it is uh, unavoidable for all of us that there is a, a boundary beyond which we are um, uncapable or unwilling to go unless we renounce our identity, our humanity, as we define it, and then, you know, it's, it's very simple. We cease to exist as we were before. Now, um, the, 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 you know, when, when Barack Obama becomes president and one of his first pledges is to close Guantanamo, and eight years later, the most powerful human on the planet, supposedly, cannot close it, uh, what is the higher authority that he, he appeals to? You know, the bureaucracy. Well, I was, I was the gonna, system. I was going to say that to, when Vinny, when you were laying out that potential and asking us if any of us could find anything to disagree with or, or, or to take exception to, it occurred to me that those who currently have power are the ones who will take exception to that. And, and they don't, you know, and it's the power behind the money in America that says no to Obama when he tries to change something. So we're invoking, you know, people put up a fight to retain power. Well, I mean, we're in a position where we come increasingly close to just lynching the bastards, right? The, the, you can't have societies that have dysfunction at the scale that our societies do without expecting discontinuous political change to come with it soon enough. So. Uh, really, we're just waiting for somebody to find an alternative to the current status quo that enough people believe in, and then people will flip these things over very rapidly because they're completely economically out of step with reality. So you say somebody to come up. <clears throat> I mean, I, I have a feeling that we're running out of an old story. Mm, yes. And an old world's falling apart faster than we're working out a new one. You bet. You bet. And I think it was, uh, was it Lee earlier today was talking about us collectively working out? Mm-hmm. The other, uh, you know, how do we, as humanity, learn and work together fast enough to answer this question? Or do we have some other single person that comes up with the next story? Um, I think we've tried this notion of collective intelligence for a really long time, and it's been, generally speaking, a total failure. The majority of the projects that are actually successfully producing are feudalism. So if you think of the way that Wikipedia works, it's a hierarchy of barons until you get to Jimmy Wales. If you think of Linux, Linux is a hierarchy of barns until you reach Linus Torvalds. These guys are essentially kings, and they operate these feudalisms out on a frontier because feudalism is very efficient on frontiers. But the myth is that you know we've gone beyond this kind of feudalism, and you know as a result these are in some sense you know group mind, cons you know deep mind. Uh, what's the word they use a lot? Uh, hive mind, consensus-based structures. They're not. They're feudal autocracies. Um, what we have is a meritocracy about who gets to be in charge of the feudal autocracy, and that meritocracy is direct conflict between these projects. What we've restored is competition in a post-democratic norm. Human nature has not changed, right? Because it would only change through biological time. However, the way we organize society is an expression not that much of human nature, in my view, of human biology, as it is expression of technology. But David, so, once we get epigenetics, biological time is one generation. So who is to say that we don't have epigenetic changes from 200 years of industrialization that have fundamentally changed human nature? We may, and, and that will complicate the, the, the scenario, of course. However, uh, I think that a fundamental definer of how we organize society is what is the uh, availability and the source of energy that we use. When we had muscle energy, we had to use slaves. 
And, and if you needed to move a boulder, either the slave moved it or you killed him and another slave moved it. Now that we have chemical energy chiefly, that is the expression of the centralized way of industrial societies. And as we move towards solar energy, that is going to be a total decentralizing force that is going to empower individuals and small groups of individuals to self-define their ways of, of, of being. And that was where I was, I was actually going to ask Lee, because in a sense your suggestion for the future of organizations was something like that, was, was increasingly autonomous, or networks of increasingly autonomous individuals given greater responsibility. And the attraction of avoiding having another ology is great, isn't it, or another ism, having some other doc dogma or doctrine. Can we operate without? Yeah, of course we can. I mean, um, every, you know, there are no good ideologies really today. I mean, they're all damaging. Um, I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for people who are motivated primarily by inequality. Um, and they want to equalize that inequality. But, you know, I'm also a student of history and every attempt to flatten out scale-free networks results in tyranny, um, or certainly so far has resulted in tyranny. Um, so it may be slightly unfashionable or not a very cool thing to say, but the basic mechanics of evolution, competition, um, and sort of, you know, individual self-interest within a framework of shared values and good behavior which you might call sort of free market economics is, is actually pretty good. Um, it's produced some really good stuff and it's produced some really good progress in contrast to um, moralizers who capture the state and think that they know best and they're gonna create a perfect world, which is always uh, a really bad idea. So what's ironic in the discussion actually is that, um, I mean, I can't speak for, uh, for Vinny and David, but you know, I feel, I find myself sort of believing more <laughs> in the basic idea of free market economics than companies who claim that that's what drives them because actually they're not the product of free markets, they're the product of protected markets and attempts to capture value um, and then not allow others in. But the downside of that is you don't evolve. Um, so when you create you know, a sort of evolutionary rock pool and you're not subject to competition anymore, you, you, you don't evolve and so you don't improve and that's when you get catastrophic um, sort of competitive threats later on from things like startups. So, I mean, I was thinking of this question in terms of organizations and I've seen it, you know, in a sense what we did at the Beeb began to test the strength of the network as against to the present incumbents. And I'm also very conscious when people are asking to get to deploy social networks in their business, they're kind of asking turkeys to vote for Christmas. And going back to Vinay's point about... But, you know, about just, just to challenge that for a second, I don't, th I, I don't see why that's true. I mean, I, I do a lot of, um, you know, sort of work with leaders of big sure. organizations and stuff, and I very rarely meet somebody that doesn't want, uh, you know, significant improvement with empowerment and with all the other no, good I, things. I, I totally agree, and I, and I talk to the same leaders. But when we're talking about deconstructing or dismantling the bureaucratic essence of the organization that Vinay was talking about. I think he may be right. We, you know, is there such a thing as a gentle revolution with this? Can we incrementally move towards that future? Okay, but if you look at uh, historical models over a 10,000 year sort of time frame, there are various basic organizational models that recur on a regular basis. One is essentially the warlord. Uh, so charismatic leader, says we're all heading in that direction, we're gonna do this amazing thing, inspires people and feeds them and protects them. And actually, there are no middle managers in that. There's no bureaucracy in that. And so what you do find with, with a lot of leaders, you know, look at Tony Shea and Zappos, et cetera, you know, they want to embody a very traditional norm of leadership and then bring people directly with them. And I think one of the really interesting things about social technology is we don't need this cascade of instructions down multiple layers through phone trees or memos, you know, one person or one group can talk to tens of thousands of people directly and you can have a presence and you can connect with them and you can sort of, you know, engage with them. So again, I actually don't think that um, people that, who are founders of companies or, you know, bosses of big companies, they're not necessarily wedded to, to a bureaucratic model. It's just, it's the only tool the in one the they toolbox. Have, yeah. and, and that was gonna be another question actually for, for, for the other two that, uh, and also, I think Lee mentioned this about getting people ready 
for this? Because in some way we've trained them to be effective in those bureaucracies and you can't just whip that away and replace it overnight. How do we help people to catch up? Um, so um, I love the neologism uh, neoteny, which is the characteristic of uh, maintaining childlike features in adulthood. Uh, being reckless, being curious, uh, disrespecting authority, all kinds of things that we associate with kids. And this is an evolutionarily adaptive behavior in rapidly changing times where you cannot be sure of your social status and the value of the skills that you acquired when you were imprinted with a university diploma, for example. Now you are done, then wait for a pension, and then die. Uh, those kinds of secure steps in life are unavailable. Uh, but we still cannot force people to be like that if they are not ready. And on the flip side, if we take away uh, a sense of dignity and self-worth from people, they have every right to tear apart the social contract and to, and to shout angrily in the faces of, of the system. Um, so it is our interest, uh, you know, those of us who care, and many people care, luckily, to renegotiate the social contract because larger and larger numbers of people are throwing in the towel. And they say, I tried everything. In the 80s, I was told that corporations are slimming down and I only need to retrain. And I did retrain, but now the rhythm is retraining every month. And I just cannot do it. And, 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 and society is not allowed to uh, expel them and, and throw them away as dispensable, worthless garbage. I, we did it with the working class. Well, we, 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 we could afford it because uh, they were not networked and they could not organize effectively. ISIS is the answer of today's age of, uh, you know, when a Canadian takes a machine gun and goes to Parliament in the name of ISIS to shoot mm. in, 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 in aggressive, destructive uh, desperation, that to me is a signal of, of, of a very new type of, of uh, 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 yeah, that's, phenomenon that's true. You that is on the planet. You got a lot of this in Scandinavia as well, don't you? That you know somebody just goes nuts with a gun because they've gotten trapped. But I mean, these kind of things are the the reason there's so much angst about this type of changes in the workplace is that it's happening to the middle class. So my background on one side of my family is working class Scottish, and the entire political economy of the working class in Scotland was destroyed maybe three times in three centuries. You know, Highland clearances followed by industrialization, followed by the industrial jobs going, followed by a brief high-tech boom, followed by permanent unemployment as a new national default. It's just that it's happening to people that are more articulate and have more money. It's exactly the same change, which is when the machines come, the jobs go. And the machines have come. They're rapidly gaining the capability of displacing the middle class. Think of, um, for example, radiology, where recognizing problems inside of an X-ray or an MRI or a PET scan is better done by a machine and a human working together, but is rapidly going to be better done simply by leaving a machine to get on with it. All of a sudden, radiologist goes from being a profession to being a box. What are we going to do with these people? Well, you know, we're going to retrain them and all the rest of it. But you know, we've never had enough jobs for 7.3 billion people. Unemployment is the natural and permanent condition of man. Employment is basically, you know, a, a weird thing that happens when you've got more natural resources than people. And we only produce the illusion of employment around us by pulling 25% of the world's resources into 5% of the world's population. In actual fact, all of these things are products of colonialism and imperialism, if you actually divide the natural resources in a genuinely equitable way, nobody's enough now natural resources to a 40 hour a week job. So the, things so are so historical the, anomalies. So with automation, say, yeah. do we end up in a world where the population that works is considerably reduced and we have to redefine the value of work and the social perspective? Yeah, or the, or, the, or do we end up society, society has to choose to work? Or, or 
do we do we find whole new different ways of adding value to each other and loosen up the work world to, why, to be less why resource based? We, why do we even need to add value to each other? Why can't we just well, exist comfortably? True. Right. I mean, if you've got your solar panels and your you know a uh, 200 year lifespan house and your vegetable garden out back and some kind of lightweight socialized medicine that will get your kids to an MRI machine if they have a bad fall and hit their head. Right. The notion that we need people to be working or generating value or I any agree. of these kind of things, all of this is colonialism. So it's a, it's a model of how, you know, yeah. this the, yeah. the, 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 the heritage of that idea is the Roman Empire or maybe a little before yeah. that. Right? It's the ancient Chinese bureaucracies. Work is not the natural condition of man. And the idea that it is the nature of man to toil is just a bug. Right? It's a so, cultural anomaly. So, Lee, we were talking about rehumanizing work. And the pr pr priority of getting the human back into the workplace. Given, given the way this conversation is going, and also given the fact that human nature is very... Uh, it can go either one way or the other, can't it? We're, you know... What does that mean when you when you talk about humanizing work, given the context of just how challenging humans are? Yeah, so, uh, you know, notwithstanding the thesis that I, I can see where you're coming from, that we don't yeah, need to work. A, it's a long-term thing. It's a long-term thing, yeah. Um, I, I like to work. Uh, I like to express myself. I like to do things with other people. And I like to grow and do things that I couldn't do yesterday. And I like crazy missions and building things that shouldn't exist and all that kind of stuff. And do you do that for money? Is, is money the purpose or a consequence? It's a consequence. It's not the purpose. That's right. So, so nobody will tell you not to do that. And whether you are going to get money for it will be totally irrelevant because your reputation, your uh, authority, and your capability of organizing resources mm is going to be mediated by platforms that do not use money as a coarse and imperfect proxy, Maybe. like we are yeah, accustomed yeah. to do today. I mean, the humanizing work thing. So, um, you know, if you look at, in a way, the social contract that you guys have alluded to is, comes from the sort of levy on mass. It's actually Napoleon onwards. Napoleon, the Industrial Revolution, the First World War, mass products, mass marketing, you know, the whole nine yards yeah, yeah. Um, and that essentially treats uh, the mass of people as a resource for others who want to do something clever like the dark satanic mills or big wars or all this kind of stuff and that's the big change so the social contract needs to actually have a lot more value for every individual uh, and this is where ideas like a basic income I think actually they're probably going to happen I mean you know it's absurdly expensive to run the nasty benefit system that we have it's probably a lot cheaper just to give everyone a basic uh, a basic income and then if you want more you you do more stuff but for as long as people need to work in order to have a good quality of life and to send their kids to good schools and all this other stuff that they want to do, um, it's really sad that many of the people on the train with you, who you mentioned, are alienated. You know, they're doing, they're performing a role, they're wearing a skin, they probably hate it, some of them, and they go home and drink or do whatever else to, to feel better about it. So humanizing the work is really about closing that gap between your own sense of self and self-worth and how you express yourself and the role, you know, the role or the sort of, uh, you know, the thing that you have to do for money. One of the startups... One of the startups at Singularity University's accelerator program that I'm advising is a Dutch uh, uh, startup that is using AI techniques to democratize access to mental health care because the pressures that we are under are affecting everybody, whether in the family, in the workplace, uh, as you try to adapt and build your future uh, more or less successfully. And it is ridiculous what amount of attention and resources we spend to um, make sure that our cars in order uh, uh, you know, every 10,000 miles or whatever it is, we go and check them up and so on. And we spend so little on, on ourselves. And I think this is also very attuned to the fact that people should care for other people. And we are having a lot of fun with that, whether it is song and dance or being a doctor or an artist. 
And, and those are areas where we will be able to thrive for a long time together with these helpers. Well, uh, just before, I'm, I'm just about to ask the audience if they have any questions, but you mentioned in your presentation that we need a science of morality. And that, that worried me slightly in the sense that those two seem uncomfortable bedfellows. Well, uh, of course, there will be a huge uh, obstacle. Uh, um, uh, organized religions will be in total upheaval because uh, they will pretend that just as for the past few hundred years about human sexuality, for example, they should be uh, entitled to a monopoly of dictating what is right or wrong from a moral point of view. So if a Google car sees that uh, 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 the GPS tells the car that it's in Saudi Arabia and its sensors uh, realize that there is a sole woman uh, in the car, uh, it will potentially legally, rightfully, uh, and morally refuse to start. Uh, and then Google, just like they did in China, possibly say, okay, I'm leaving that market because I cannot market. comply with those moral requirements. By the way, in the FT today, uh, Alphabet, the new holding company, they abandoned Don't Be Evil, and they said the new watchword is Obey the Law. Wow. So maybe Alphabet That's will go horrendous. back to China. That's horrendous. So the new, uh, there's an article in the Financial Times uh, today. Huh? Yesterday. Uh, yesterday, sorry. And, um, uh, you know, Google had this don't be evil um, motto, I guess. And now it's obey the law, I believe. Uh, don't break the law. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, in, I think, interpreted in this article as, as meaning sort of obey the local laws of countries. Oh, yeah, which de define right. Primarily. But actually, just before we go over to the audience, to come back to the idea of training people, in a sense, that is, you know, the manifestation of people who say, oh, I don't do technology. You know, they're sort of being lazy and letting people like Google and Facebook and everybody else decide so much that's really important about our lives. But many times they're not ready to, and, and you wanted to pick up on the whole, how do we get people ready, Vinay? Well, so I think this boils down to kind of Pat Kane's thesis about play, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. you know, most of the engineers that I'm working for are uh, in their 20s and 30s. And they all grew up on Warcraft. So for them, rapid assembly of a 40-person team with lots of disparate skills being quickly tied together for a six-hour job and then everybody goes back to doing what they were doing before is something they've practiced a thousand times. Yeah. Whereas for me, 20 years older than that, uh, I have a model which will operate slower and for six to 10 people. So I'm constantly amazed by how quickly they can organize because the games that they played prepared them for the future that they wound up in. Interesting. Uh, and I think that we'll find over and over and over again that the kids are playing games that then rapidly become so, adults. So, I mean, it sort of goes back to the question yesterday about age. Mm. And, and I was resisting the idea that age is the defining factor, that it's more to do with openness or closeness. It's almost like a willingness to play and tinkering. Being exploratory is the key set of skills, isn't it? Well, I mean, if you're playing the same games that the 16-year-olds are playing, then you're having the same experiences the 16-year-olds are having, so you remain kind of generationally current. Um, and I think that there's a lot of virtue also to people aging and understanding that that gives them a different set of skills. So I kind of figured out sort of what are you know, middle-aged guys good at culturally, and I've been practicing more and more and more of that set of skills, because, you know, it's just kind of like, well, if I'm dressed for this role, I might as well learn I'll how to... I'll give you some tips later. Well, no, seriously. <laughs> Any uh, c questions or comments from, from the audience? Have we got some microphones? <laughs> questions related to the previous presentation? There's a chap there. So uh, I would like to propose a bug for Vinay uh, proposal. I hope it's not that silly. I mean, um, there was the transparency thing, and uh, you basically proposed to uh, register every citizen, okay? Name can be an um, ID, a name, everything. It's a convention, so our, our name, our real name is a convention as well. So um, this means that if something is broken in the convention, no one knows I am who I am, even me. So 
I would like to say maybe there is a bug over there, so um, it's easier to crack a code than to crack a bunch of, pe of, of, of persons. Uh -huh. So you can easy, it's more easy to make someone someone else or to create a total mess breaking this convention yep. and closing it. Um, the thing I want to point out is not that one. Actually, uh, I thought, um, it's following what you said, we, we are, uh, ex um, like every code is a convention. We are doing a lot of conventions. Social network are conventions. Yep. Um, and the thing is that these conventions are going simpler and simpler, so people are easily accepting it. Yep. I know, uh, I'm not meaning hashtags, which are very simple, simple to understand how, how conventions, yep. but um, yep. Facebook, the whole Facebook design is a convention, and yep. everyone is accepting it. Yeah. And it's very super cool. hard now to go out of the Facebook convention, okay? So yeah. in the I, I agree with everything proposing, you said so far. Yeah. People may get stuck in a society, in a very, very simple convention, mm. and there is no way to go out. So yeah, kind of like so. we did with the book. Like we get to a point where there's a whole bunch of evolution of the book where we go from, what do they call them, palimpsests, and then we invent punctuation and all the rest of it. And then we get to the point where it's good enough and we stop there. I definitely agree that might happen, but I don't think we're there yet in software. I think there's another generation or two to come, but only time will tell. Thanks, Mary. Any other comments or questions? Is that there? Palm passed. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, during the last presentation, you were wondering why it appears so simple and why it was not made already this sort of revolution of simplifying and accepting. And you put us as an audience question, why did it happen? And <clears throat> what I, I could easily understand is that thinking as a kid and putting myself, the simplest question was probably that the money as a convention mm -hmm. is the major obstacle. Mm -hmm. if, you th if you rethink of what we have spoke about here in these days, mm -hmm. and you get rid of the concept of money, mm -hmm. probably that will be the answer. So the provocation is, is money our final obstacle in terms of final convention we have to bypass? Oh, yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay, so be let me take a crack at this from an odd angle. So the money we have right now is just a single piece of information, right? Your, your balance is 79 pounds or 141 euros or wherever it happens to be. And I think that this kind of notion that value is stored as single numbers is a really poor fit for what's happening. What I want, if I've got some valuable object like an artwork, is the entire history of the artwork and incredibly high resolution scans of the thing so I can validate it. If I'm buying, uh, say, a wooden table, I want a history of the table so that there's a provenance of the value of the thing. And I think that in the future, we can easily imagine a society in which everything carries its history with it. And the value of an idea is fanned out across all the people that were involved, which would be a bit like Image and Heap's mycelia proposal, or we have physical tracking of the asset's history, like the Providence HQ proposal. You know, there are lots of people who are approaching this idea of building these kind of rich value objects that then do many of the same things that we do with currency, but they carry the entire context with them. So my belief is that in the long run, money will turn out to get out-competed for the same reason that barter was out-competed. That if you carry much more information, much more richness, then you wind up with exchange of you know, entire stories of value for other stories of value in a way where money seems like it just throws away most of what you needed to know before you could purchase. But I don't think that gets us away from scarcity. It's just that you end up with a more sophisticated map of what we lack. And I don't know what to do about that. Um, a, a, a very um, simple test of uh, how and when traditional currencies are going to potentially start disappearing is when you will be able to start paying your taxes in cryptocurrencies. Um, as long as that doesn't happen, there is a legal uh, anchor that protects the traditional money system. 
Um, now, just like bacteria, under some definitions, are still the ruling uh, uh, life form on the planet, um, similarly, not necessarily nation states or traditional money or, or whatever other types of organizations are going to disappear. But in biology, the fun stuff happens elsewhere. It's, it's not the bacteria in the oceans that we observe each day what they are dreaming about, star flights. Uh, similarly, in, in human organizations, it is likely that the fun stuff is going to be done by things that are different from a nation state or from traditional types of hierarchical organizations. Last question for the panel, and you can give me a one more answer if you want. I doubt it. Is this going to turn out well? Is what going to turn out well? These changes, the whole accelerating... Of course they are. We're humans. Jesus, I mean, we go through all, all kinds of stuff and we adapt and we work it out and we sort of change a little bit and we get on with it. It's awesome. I mean, the level of freedom that we all have compared to 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago, it's ridiculous. We're having fun. Um, you know, there's a lot of problems we need to solve that we probably can solve, including some of the biological ones, you know, some of the inequality ones, you know, there's so much potential for humans joining together, using smart technology to really solve some, uh, some big problems. Hey, you know, this is all going to be fine. Don't worry about it. David? Totally agree. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I almost have a... <laughs> all right, yeah. good enough, good enough. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs>